Hey everyone, welcome back to The Leadership Project with your host Mick Spears. Our vision is to inspire all leaders to challenge the status quo. We bring you weekly topics and thought-provoking guests to get you to stop, reflect and think about what it means to be a leader in a modern world. Our aim is to help you become the leader you wish you always had as we learn together and lead together. Today's episode is brought to you by Pat Flynn and his team at SPI or Smart Passive Income. I'm often asked questions about how I do all the things I do, whether it be this podcast, our cohort-based courses, or just structuring my business. Well, Pat has been a great inspiration to me and I benefit greatly from being part of his community, SPI Pro, and from the SPI courses and workshops they offer. We are including a link in the show notes where you too can apply to be a part of SPI Pro or take advantage of their amazing courses and workshops. Now, on with the show. Hey everyone and welcome back to The Leadership Project. I'm greatly honoured today to be joined by a dear friend, Charlie Feynman. Charlie is an award-winning strategist and a brand storyteller and he's the director of account strategy at TOT Creative. And here's the interesting thing. I've been a client of Charlie for a few years and we've worked on a couple of brand launches together. And what I've seen in Charlie is something really interesting, this great blend of someone that really understands what a brand is, embodies what it is to be a great storyteller, but then he also works in what I consider from the outside to be a very high performance team. So in today's episode, we're going to explore those three topics. We're going to talk about branding, what it is, why it's important, and what the leader's role is related to being a brand ambassador and ensuring that you're living that brand. We're going to talk about storytelling. And I think many people in the audience do understand the power of storytelling. Maybe not everyone, so we'll cover that as well. But many people don't know where to start. So we'll talk about how do you embody this kind of storyteller mode in your role as a leader. And then I'm going to take a little bit of liberty and share with Charlie what I saw from the outside of his team and see if it was felt from the inside. And that's intellectual curiosity uh, at, at its highest, but I also believe that you're going to get some great benefit of that. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Charlie. Uh, Charlie, please uh, say hello to our audience. Tell us a little bit more about your background and what led you to be with us today. Well, Mick, first, let me tell you that uh, you are too kind. Uh, that was a tremendous introduction. Uh, I've got a little over 11 and a half years of professional experience now. That started off for me, uh, actually, I took, originally was in school full-time, end up going part-time at Arizona State to have this full-time opportunity to work uh, for the radio station out there that is the ESPN radio affiliate, as well as their news station. Uh, had the opportunity to do some really amazing things, especially while for being in school as <laughs> to, to as a full. I actually covered um, Major League Baseball and NBA teams uh, for full seasons while I was in school, working as a reporter, working as a producer of a of an of a afternoon drive talk show. Uh, I had really cool, interesting opportunities to to manage those communications to see how that worked uh, at, at an early early in my career, which is really exciting. Uh, from there, you know, I wanted to keep going in sports to an extent, so I came to DC. I got my master's degree in sports management. Uh, which is basically business with sports sprinkled on it like that a little bit. Uh, and then worked for the, the Washington football team, which is now the Washington Commanders. Uh, and so worked with them for a couple of years in their marketing department, you know, doing uh, a, lot of, a lot of different things there as well with a lot of their partners. And then the last, most of the last six years uh, have been in agencies. Uh, and so for the last two and a half of those years, I've been at COD Creative. Uh, and as you mentioned, I am the director of account strategy uh, there. Uh, one of our, one of our couple that are on the team uh, and, couldn't be more excited to talk to you today. I, I get so jazzed up to talk about brand, uh, talk about marketing, talk about all this stuff, and and also talk about leadership. I think it's so it's not talked about enough. I feel like I mean it's it's weird because it's talked about a lot, but it's also not really talked about sometimes in the right way. And I am yeah. excited because I know just from having worked with you, uh, you know that that 
it's going to be talked about the right way on this podcast. Yeah, so okay. I'm very excited. Well, it's certainly our passion and it's, and it's our vision to inspire all leaders to challenge the status quo. And challenging the status quo means having conversations about it. I do think the leadership conversation has become richer in the last few years, but there's a long way to go before we can say uh, that we're there. And you look at the stats uh, that we follow, like uh, the Association of Talent Development, and it shows that only 16% of people in the world truly love their job and like their boss. And I believe that you and I are lucky. What, what I see in you, and I'm going to test this later, you are one of those 16%. And for many of my jobs, not every job that I've done in my career, I've also felt it. But um, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not universal. Common knowledge about leadership is not common. And common knowledge is not common practice. And that's why we have these conversations to try and push that well, agenda and get people to... That's a great way to put it. Yeah. We need people to stop and reflect and rethink what it means to be a leader. So the richer the conversation, the better. And so glad that you're willing to have a chat with us about that today. Yeah, likewise. All right. You pique my curiosity here. And we'll see how we go with this one. I did not know that about you, that you had that background uh, around sports management. So. I immediately think of a few things when I hear sports management. I just want to test it with you. I think of Arliss Michaels. I don't know if you remember that show, Arliss. And I think of Jerry Maguire. So tell me, uh, when we see the larger-than-life illustration of sports management in TV and movies, is that what it's really like? Uh, I think it's a lot less – it's interesting, right, because I think at certain levels – um, if you're, if you're in a, if you're, if, depending on what type, what branch of sports management you go into, if you, if you go in to be an agent, right. And you go that path and it's hard, it is hard to be in that place where you're that person that's on the phone with the superstar in, in that room. Right. And it takes it, it like anything, uh, it, it takes a lot of effort to get to that place most of the time. And there's not anyone that's ever really like handed that opportunity like that per se. Um, and so it's something that. I think, like anything, if you work hard at it, you can get rewarded in that sense. But to, to actually be there, and, and especially on game days, like there's a big difference in the sports world of like, there's the nine to five type sports world where you are working on things. But then you also have, you know, when working in the NFL, you have Sundays during the season. You have the regular season, you have the playoffs. You have these moments where as a brand, right, as, as an organization, and you're working with your partners, you have these amazing things where you have hundred thousand people coming to one place to, to do one shared experience. Uh, and you know, that they're all going to be excited. You know, they're all going to have a great time if their team is, if their team is winning. And, mm. and so you just, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful melting pot of ideas and creativity a lot of the time. And I think that the people who thrive in that environment are people who really have a, a knack for seeing where opportunities exist uh, to take advantage of the fact that you have people coming in to give those people great experiences and make them feel extra excited about being yeah. at the game. And then also to help further the, the team's brand and, and, and the smaller brands along with that. Um, so it's really, it's really fun. It's, 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 it's an exciting field to be in. Uh, it's just, you know, like anything, I think there are, there are, you know, there are drawbacks and there are pros and cons to it. Yeah, sure. Well, there's something that I'm thinking of and I want to test with you. And it comes out in some of the language that you're using there as well, Charlie. And this might lead us beautifully into the conversation about what a brand is. When I look at sports in particular, there is something a little unique there. And you can tell me if, if you disagree, of course. But let's take NBA. So the NBA itself is a brand. Then you have teams or franchises that are a brand. But then you have individual superstars that come through as a personal brand. So you think about NBA is a brand, Chicago Bulls is a brand, but Michael Jordan is also a brand. Yeah. Is that unique in sports or do you see that in other worlds where you get these kind of clashing or, or coinciding of brands? I think it's, it's, it's definitely something that has become more common. I, you know, I think brand partnerships just in a general sense have become more common. I think you see it a lot in, I think sports overlaps a lot with pop culture. And I think the two of those things uh, is where, is it, that's where you see that the most. Like you'll see, you know, for instance, one of the most famous instances of this, because they just, you know, obviously after the incident in Houston had canceled some of the shoe drops, 
Mr. Travis Scott had a deal with the Jordan brand, right? And so there's a, there's a person, it's a brand that is working with another brand and kind of in that partnership space from a, you know, business to individual standpoint, like in that direct laddering down, I don't know that that actually happens too often elsewhere. You, mm. I can't think of an example off the top of my head where, yeah. um, you know, maybe, maybe with certain big, you know, you could see it potentially happening with like big organizations. Uh, you know, you may have, uh, you think about Apple, right? Yeah, like right. Steve Jobs, Tim Cook. Like though, I don't know that Tim Cook has as much of a brand Definitely as Steve Jobs, Jobs probably yeah. did. Yeah, but like that is where the only time I've really seen it is where you have those big like Zuckerberg, right? Like Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg yeah. is a brand amongst itself with he, Meta. Yeah, Elon Musk. Uh, he has yeah. a, he has a personal brand, whether he likes it or not. Um, <laughs> you you have uh, people UFC, like UFC. I mean, it's in it's sports, but also like UFC is interesting with their announcers because their announcer, I mean, Joe yeah, Rogan right. is very much a personal brand. Yeah. Uh, yeah good you know, good and, example as well. Yeah. 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 Really, really interesting. Um, and what I'm, what I'm thinking in that is, is, a, is about the business side of that. Now I'm going to throw a, one of my favorite quotes to you and get your reaction to this. And now this one's music. Music might be another one that's a little bit like this and the personal yeah. brands really shine through maybe even more than the record labels at this point. But Jay-Z, one of his favorite, fav, um, famous quotes is, I'm not a businessman. I'm a business man. What does that make you think when you hear that? I mean, I, I think that that is... It's true on so many different levels that it is, it makes me think a lot of things. I mean, first and foremost, I think of, you know, you may be a businessman, right? Like in that sense, like you're a business person, you're going to work, you're like doing these things, right? But how you present yourself, how you, how you treat other people, how you treat your colleagues, how you treat your clients, how you work, how you treat yourself, how you love and treat yourself is reflected in that uh, in, in, in everything that you do in that business. So you might be working in, as a businessman in a business, but you're a business man in the sense that you are your own brand. Every one of us is their own brands. And actually you bring me to my favorite question that I ask on, and I think so maybe I'm going to turn this around a little bit and ask you a question. Hey, go for it. Uh, I'll I'll up here, uh, is, is, is my favorite interview question personally is how would you describe your personal brand? Mm. And like that's, and that is, and personal brand is a big part of this. So, and, you know, how would you describe your personal brand? Yeah, that's a great question, um, Charlie. And it, and it comes down to a few adjectives. For me, it's passion. So my personal brand is about passion and energy, about leading with my purpose and my values. So I, I tell everyone that will listen and even those that won't listen about my mission that I'm on, about my purpose, and about the fact that my personal values are very important to me. So I think that in my case, my personal brand, yes, I'm recognized and have experience as a leader for three decades. I, um, I had certain technical prowess in my, in my field of work, but, but really my brand is the ability to inspire people around purpose and meaning and to share with them my yeah. vision of the world with, with a lot of um, clarity, being able to articulate it with clarity and then to inspire people into meaningful action around that brand. So I think my, oh, sorry, around that vision. So I think my personal brand is actually about how I portray myself uh, on the world uh, with the way that I communicate. Yeah, I think that I, would, I, can, I can attest to that. I feel like that's an accurate representation of who you are as, as a brand. And I think you'll feel the same about mine. Uh, my, my, my brand is energy. Like that is what it is. That's the essence of my brand. That's what I bring you know, to everything. And and I love, but I love that question, right? Because it tells you so much about how a person thinks about themselves. And, yeah. and, and so often, like on interviews and things like that, people are like, oh my gosh, this is a great question. And they have to sit there for a few minutes and think about it. Because yeah. most people never think about themselves in that way. They don't think about their, their, their brand. They think about, even in, even in our space, right? Even in the brand space and the marketing yeah. space, like people don't always think about it like that. And, and some people joke about it like, oh, you're in, are you an Instagram influencer? Do you really care about your brand aesthetic like that? Yeah. And to me, it's, of course I do. I, I, it's everything, that, like every experience, every touch point, for lack of a better word, that you have with me is like an advertisement of my values to you. And so I want to represent myself well in that. I want to talk. And, and this is something I've learned because I haven't always been, I've always been this way. Like I, there, are, there are times in the past where I used to, 
I, I, I didn't always treat people the best, right? Like, and, 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 I've, and I've learned from that and, and have hopefully grown from that and hopefully that comes across in, in, in some ways. But understanding that and, and thinking, <laughs> as my cat falls off this tree, uh, and thinking, thinking like about that in that way uh, is something that doesn't happen that often. Yeah. And, and it's something that people like need to do more of. Uh, we don't often give homework here on the podcast, but I'm going to do it here. There's two things I want you to think about right now. I want you to think about that Jay-Z quote. Are you a businessman or are you a business man? So what, what we mean by that is do you treat your own personal brand and the way you carry yourself, the way you present yourself to your team, to the people around you, do you portray yourself in the way that you want to be seen, right? So treat your own personal brand as something that's, that's very precious. And then the second one, and I wasn't expecting Charlie to ask that question, but I, I feel like I am in touch with my personal brand, so I'm glad that he did ask it. If you were sitting in front of Charlie right now and he said to you, what's your personal brand, would you know the answer? That might be something that's worth some deep reflection for you to think about over these uh, coming weeks. And by all means, uh, th- those that are in our Facebook community group, if you want to share your answer, I'd love to have a conversation with you around what you think your personal brand is and why it might be important. All right, Charlie, th- there's something I wanted to come back to that you were also alluding to when you were talking in, in those sports brands and you spoke about Sundays and NFL. Everything that you're talking about whether you realized it or not, and my feeling is you did realize it, everything you spoke about was about emotion. You're talking about how the fans are going to feel when their team is winning, how their fans are going to feel when their team isn't winning, and what is happening at that moment. What role does emotion play in brand? Oh, I mean, it is, I don't want to say it's everything because it's not everything, right? Like there are other components to it, uh, you know, but, but it is a lot. Uh, you know, to me, a brand is the sum of every emotion that you feel in your interactions with it to some extent. It's like, and that's not the firm definition. I think that we'll talk about exactly what a brand can be and what it is a little bit later. But like, for me, thinking about emotion, that is the thing when you, when, when people come to me and say, oh, how did you, you're pitching your business? Like, what is the thing that separates a, a, you know, a win from something that you, maybe you got like second or third? And to me, more often than not, it's, it's how much did you emotionally connect with the people that you were talking to? How much, you know, from a brand standpoint, uh, you know, how much do you emotionally connect with that brand? And people think about emotions and they think about, oh, is it something that connects with my heart or something like that? And that's not always the case. It could be something that emotions come from a lot of different places and a lot of different places from our lives as well. You know, if you see, if there's a, a friend, a close friend that you have, right, that, that has one type of specific worldview, you might have a different interaction with a brand because of the emotions that you feel for that friend. And you, if, you, if that is brand makes you associate with that friend in a lot of ways, if that makes sense, where, where if you, you, may not, you may not actually realize it, but like emotions come into play every single time you interact with someone. And I think right now, obviously, with a great example of this right now is, you know, I don't want to use the word great around war in the general sense, but like a very good example of this relative to what we're talking about right now is, you know, the viral clip that's going around. I've seen it a few different times on, the, on, on Instagram over the last couple of days of, of the CNN story where they're pl- showing Kiev with blaring sirens, right? The, the air raid sirens are on mm. and it cuts directly to a commercial for Applebee's, yeah. like without yeah. skipping a beat. Right. And while that's not, you don't think emotionally about an Applebee's commercial all the time, you're emotionally so charged Charged by what you've just been watching. And then you go into this commercial, that's going to connect with that person. Like that's, it's, it's these, all of these, and and our chief creative officer, Terry, uh, Chris Lester, he, he talks about this a lot. It's, it's a brand and and emotion. It's this, it's what you're signaling to people and how you are signaling people to feel. And so it comes into brand in every sense of the way, like smells and in every sense too. It's not just what you see, it's what you hear yeah. and it's what you feel in something tacile, like something that's tactile and that you can feel something that you smell, like all those things come into play with the brand. And the, I think some of the best brand activations and, and like those, those Sunday type moments that I've ever seen 
are those things that engage those senses the most and consistently across every interaction that you have. And, and cause that's how you really generate that emotion. And it's, it, it is, it is, it's so important though. Like it is, it's, it's a lot of it. Like if you don't have emotion, what are people going to connect with? Yeah. Yeah. Really good, Charlie. And that's one interesting one to think about there is about that brand association as well. I hadn't seen that viral clip. I'm going to look at it now and, and see what's going on there. But but the the emotional charge state that someone's in when they encounter your brand and your business, that's something for us all to think about. What is the state? Meeting people where they are at. If they if they're in an emotionally charged state, you need to know that, right? And, and yeah, very interesting. All right, we've tinkered around the edges a little bit now, and we're starting to cover it. Let's get into this topic about what is a brand. Now, a lot of people will immediately associate brand with things like logos and word marks and all that kind of stuff. And that's certainly part of branding. But for you, Charlie, what is a brand? So I, I always love to use uh, Marty Neumeier, who's a very well-established author in the brand space, uh, his, what he says about brands. Uh, and, and he says, a brand is not what you say it is. It's what they say it is. And to me, that is the truth. Uh, and that is ultimately what a brand is. A brand is all the, the sum total of other people's opinions and feelings and emotions and the signals that they read towards that brand. And so you can create any logo that you want, any word mark that you want. You can have any name, you can make it as fancy as you want. But the way that the very end touch point of that brand makes someone feel that stays with that person, that, that, that how they feel about that brand is what the brand is. And the reason behind that is because word of mouth is, will be, and has always been the strongest form of marketing. And so when you think about, you know, marketing communications and people talking about a brand, what they say about it is what people trust more than advertisements. And so ultimately what they say about it is what the brand is. And so in both in practice of creating a brand, thinking about it from an audience perspective and, and, and how people, everyday people, every person that's interacting with it feels is important. But then it's also, you know, thinking past that to, you know, when we have the brand, what are they going to say? What are people going to say about this brand? How are they going to feel about this? And if people, if the answer to that question is like, it's, it's not going to inspire people. Like people are going to say, okay, like I've seen a thousand of these. Like this is this, I, you know, there's a, a hundred of these things. And maybe, maybe, maybe you need to send a different signal. Um, and so it's, I mean, that to me, a brand is, is that is, is what they say it is. It is a sum of every interaction. That is, that is really, to me, what it is more than anything else. Two really powerful things there, Charlie, I want to play back and, and go from there. So first one for the audience, I'm going to repeat what Charlie said to make sure it sinks in. All right. So uh, a brand is not what you say it is. It's what they say it is. So it's about what feelings do other people uh, feel about your brand and your business or whatever your organization is? The second part that was really important was the third party trust or social proof. So they will trust more what their network of friends think about that brand. So whether it's Ford, Tesla, Amazon, Coca Cola, Facebook, it's what other people say it is. It's not what you say it is. And brand strategists like Charlie, they do spend a lot of time trying to curate a brand in a way that they're trying to evoke in a certain motion, but the result is what the brand is, is when other people talk, imagine that you're at a dinner party and you're talking with your friends and Jeff Bezos and Amazon comes up, it's how people talk about that brand is what the brand really is and that's what's impactful to your business. All right, so if that's the case, Charlie... What can we do about that? How do we how do we build that into understanding that it's what other people say about our business that's important? How do we build that into a brand strategy? So, I mean, that is where, to me, is where the brand and the leadership it overlap, and that's where that intersection is. And then that is, and that's why we're talking about this, right? Like that, to, to some extent, to me, like that is. <laughs> that's that's where that's where that intersect is and to me you know a brand is how a brand is rolled out internally to an organization or or 
if it's not a large organization or how a brand is prepared for those who are rolling it out, who are going to be the people introducing it is the most important thing because, and then Nick, this is something that we worked on together, you know, as, 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 as client agency relationship type thing in, in the sense it's like, the people who are on the very, very fringes of the internal brand are the frontline people for the external brand. Those are the people that are talking to the people who are going to decide what the brand is, right? And so those people, if the message of the brand, you, I, you and I can sit here and create the greatest messaging and the greatest logo of all time. But if that messaging and that logo has not reached the very, very fringe person in our organization to, and it hasn't, and not just reached them, if it hasn't resonated with them to the point that they not only know what the brand is supposed to be, but they feel invigorated, empowered, and, and, and inspired to as a, almost the brand is a rallying cry for them. That brand is not going to grow in the way that it could. It might succeed. Like, I'm not going to say it's not going to succeed overall, but like, it's not going to be as good as it could be. And those, those, those fine touch points on the, the, the border between internal and external, where people interact with the people, interact with the brand. Yeah. Whether that be on social media, whether that be on sales calls, whether that be on customer service calls, or you know, if you're, if you're calling for help with it with a product that you have, that person that you're speaking to, you know, if they are on brand, for lack of a better term, and they're really about it, you're gonna leave that conversation like, wow, like this is really like that. Why? Oh, yeah, okay, I can kind of feel this about this. I'm I'm on board with this, and 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 you know, a great example of this, uh, just if I may, um, I, I'm a big fan of this water brand called Liquid Death. Uh, I would encourage everyone to take a look at their brand, go to their website, because I'm not, I'm not sponsored by Liquid Death in any way, I just really like the water. Um, it's water, it's in a can like this, but the brand is amazing. Their tagline is murder your thirst. And like you think about this at a high level and it's like, okay, this is kind of aggressive, like, but it's, it's cool, it's a catchy brand. But the thing that stands out about it is I had an issue where I had a box get delivered of this water where it was like shattered because like it had been roughed up in, tra in translation. And so I emailed their customer service team and they wrote me back a response where there was like scathing about U.S. Post Service where they were just like, they just throw things around. They don't care. It was, and it was just such an on-brand message, but it wasn't like pre-written. Like it was very custom to my situation. So the person right. that wrote that back to me believed and felt brand right like this person like understood the brand he, and, and it was a guy named jeff i think and he felt the brand and he was like this is uh and i was like whoa i left that feeling like oh my goodness like yeah and of course i like this water like because they 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 are like this is who they are like this is this is this water and i'm like i'm on board with this because it resonates with me and so that touch point on the fringe more than anything else even though i'm an in brand and i love the design i love the messaging i love all this other stuff more than anything else that stood out to me about this brand was that one interaction that I had with a customer service rep over email. And that has made me be a recurring customer for them for the last six months since I found out about it because of that. Uh, and I think that that is that signal that they sent is like, they really feel this way. This isn't just some facade for them. That stands out. And that is ultimately to me what resonates and why it is so important to have that, those touch points be the thing that you think about when you're rolling a brand out because if he doesn't get to that surface, if it doesn't get to that, that depth, it's not going to succeed. Thanks, Charlie. Um, this is a really good example and we might keep on building on that. I want to build the, the, the fabric up a little bit more and then summarize. What role there do you think voice of the brand has? And if you can explain to people what voice of the brand is and then the role in that experience that you've just had. So, yes, I can, I can definitely do that. So I would say there's two components to voice. There's the voice and then there's the tone. And so there are two, those are two different things. Voice is consistent. It is who you are day in and day out. It is, it is, it is what the brand is. It is what it, it is. It is what it represents and what you, what you're trying to speak to truth, basically, like all about the brand. Tone is a little bit more, you know, that can change. If you're in a more casual setting, you might have a more casual tone. You might, you know, your brand might throw some shade every now and then if you want to. Uh, but the voice of that brand is really a reflection of all of the people in that brand. And that is the most important thing, people that are working in that organization. And we, we talk to clients all the time about wanting to do, hey, we want to survey your whole company. We want to talk to everyone, right? 
we don't just want to talk to your executives because the people that make the brand up, the people that are you know grinding the gears on whatever the product is, whatever the organization is, those people, their voice, their voice is the brand voice in a lot of situations. And hearing from them and having a voice that is reflective of your values and what you want to set as an organization and having the people that that meshes with or vice versa, like in whichever order they kind of come is paramount. Because again, if, if those people are not buying into that message and that voice does not reflect how they feel and what resonates with them, they're not going to be able to speak in that voice. And those touch point reactions we just talked about are never going to be able to happen in the way that you want them to happen. And so you know, the minute details of that and, and, and including people and being, and being inclusive and, and, and diverse and equitable in the way in which you approach the voice and how you're generating that voice and making sure that it is actually reflective of all of the people in your organization and not just a select few cannot, it's, 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 it's incredibly important. It can't be underemphasized how crucial that is to having a successful brand and, and, and a rollout that is reflective of what you want the brand to be in the public's eyes. All right, one more build up before we bring this uh, to a good conclusion on brand. What about values? What's the intersection between brand and values? It is, I would say, you know, if, if you meet at that intersection we just talked about, about brand um, and, and, and some of these, these other components, right, of voice, I think behind the touch points, behind the voice, you know, back behind that, there are the values. The values almost are, it's like a layer deeper than voice, I guess is the best way to put it. Because, you know, you can signal a lot of things as a brand. And I think one of the best ways to talk about brand values is to talk about the way in which a lot of brands handle LGBTQ, like awareness, especially during uh, like Pride and Pride Month. And you will see a lot of brands that will just slap up a rainbow logo and call it a day. Right. And they will say, like, we stand with the LGBTQ community and we're going to be there and we're going to be part and we're going to do these things. And then we're, we're excited. And, and they have a logo up and that's basically it. And they talk a lot. Values are equal to action for me. And, you know, we talk to clients a lot about, you know, the values that go behind a brand. We're working on a style guide or we're working on messaging. But are those like, you could talk about values and what you want them to be. There's an idealistic, value set that you might have, but what actually are your values? How equitable is your organization? How do you actually treat people? Do you actually care about those people? Do you go out of your way? If you want to have a fun brand, do you go out of way, out of the way to make sure that your people are having fun? You know, do you, you know, if you want to, if you're a brand that's going to be outwardly supporting mothers, do you have nursing stations for the mothers in your organization in your building or do you provide them a subsidy for having child care services if they're working from home thinking through like those details are everything because what happens is when you, a brand and an organization or a business has those values and they live those values just like that and they have those rooms they have these things for people that they talk about and they walk the walk and talk the talk that's when they're signaling and people see it and they say, yeah, they, they really live up to this. And, and that's when the resonance happens. That resonance doesn't happen if, because everyone, you know, Amazon can talk all day long about whatever they want to talk. I know you, you mentioned Amazon, so I'm going back to them. Uh, but the, you know, they can talk all day long about how great they are for this or how great they are for that. But we all know the stories. We've all seen the documentaries and the, and the reports from news stations about the 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 way they treat their employees in their fulfillment centers, right? To me, that is the brand. I think of Amazon. I think of I'm going to get it quick, and they're you know they're they're probably not treating people the best, but I'm, it's going to come to me fast, and 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 they're going to have people that are going to be there quickly, and then they're going to probably leave. They're probably not you know it's it's turnover, it turnover for packages, turnover for people because they don't treat the people very well. That's what I associate with that brand because I see that. If they had amazing policies and then all these great things that people were so overwhelmingly happy about that we were that, that signaled outwardly, you would know about it. You would, you, it, would, it would seem more genuine when you hear like Jeff Bezos talk about like all the great things that they do. You know, and to me, 
if your values, if those core values are not true and genuine to who you actually are, your brand is, it's, it's really a facade. And you, you need to, <laughs> and as a leader in a lot of ways, right? If, if you think that the brand is reflective of your values, but if you were to survey your team and they say otherwise, mm. how well are those values being distributed to that team? So I'm just going to throw one word to you there, Charlie, and that's authenticity. Everything that you were just uh, coming up could be best summarized around authenticity, uh, living the brand in that way that people feel and see that you stand by what you say it is, right? So I want to summarize a little bit and then get on to the role of the leader in all of this. So what you've heard from Charlie, your brand is not what you say it is, it's what other people say it is. For those other people to talk about you, they need to feel your brand. They need to feel what is important to you, your values. They need to feel your voice, all right, so if you want to be fun, approachable, etc., you every brand ambassador in the organization needs to have a tone and a voice that is fun and approachable. If you want to be prestige and luxury, everything that people feel about your brand needs to feel prestige and luxury and they need to feel very special uh, to you. If you want your whole brand to be around trust, every action that you take needs to build and retain trust and never break that trust, right? So it's your actions and how every brand ambassador in your organization lives and breathes a brand is then what drives what people say about you. I'm going to borrow some words from my good friend David Nor here and say that most everyone has a BS radar. Most everyone has a BS radar. So if you're out there telling the world that this is what you stand for and this is our values, this is our uh, ethics, this is our brand, and then your actions and behaviours are well known to be inconsistent with that, people see straight through it and your brand is what they say it is, not what you say it is. That's the summary of what Charlie is trying to share with us. Right, Charlie, what's the role of the leader then? We are the leadership project. A lot of this brand stuff typically gets managed from corporate, but everyone has a responsibility here. What's the leader's responsibility for brand? So I think the number one thing that a leader needs to do with a brand is to trust their team more than anything else. And, and we'll talk about the other pieces of that. But like for me, from a brand perspective as a leader, you have to trust the people that you have on your team who are helping you define the brand. You have to trust them that they, they know what they're talking about. They've hired the right people that know what they're talking about. or that they're, they've, they've talked to the team and they're, they are representing the collective nature of what, uh, of, of, of what people underneath of them are talking about. And so, and there is a lot of, there's a heavy burden of trust and they had that those, that those teammates need to live up to that, but you need to trust them as a leader, because if you try to silo a brand decision or a, or, or what the brand is to yourself, it is not going to resonate with much of anybody. And to me, trusting people is, is really key in, 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 in that, but then, you know, outside of being able to trust the team and, and, and that stuff from a leadership perspective, for me, it's really about exemplifying the brand at the leadership level uh, and, and, and in everything that you do and in every action that you take. So if your brand is you know, focused on people and caring and equity and inclusion, you're not sitting on a call after it ends with two members of the team out of the 10 that were on the call and throwing shade at three of the other people that were on the call and, 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 you know, and saying hurtful things about them or, or complaining about them or, or even just not even having open communication with them and being transparent about things. And, you know, and, and so you have to be, you have to, and this is, you know, be a change you want to see in the world is, you know, a lot of people say that, but like, be the change you want to see in your brand. Like be that, you know, if, if you have, if you're like, all right, our brand is going to really speak to people. We're going to be focused on 
you and on you and what you're doing in your life and helping you to do it better, then as a leader, you should be making sure that you're helping everyone on your team to do those same things better, to do, to, to reach their goals, to, to do the things they want to do in a way that they, that aligns with what the brand visions and the values and, and all the things we just talked about are, are uh, you know, pr- the way they're presented. And if you do that, then those people underneath of you are going to feel that and they're going to pass that on because you're you're putting that in the right space, and that is how it eventually gets to that 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 fringe between internal and external that we talked about, where that kind of goes downhill. That, that positivity just rolls right on down, and it, and it, and, it, and it it energizes an organization, whether it's ten people or a thousand people or, or fifty thousand people, right? And to me, the leader's role in that is is be you're, you're the tip of the spear. And without you being sharp, you're not going to be effective. And and so you have to be on that. You're making me think of a very old adage in leadership that I haven't used or heard for quite some time. It's it's kind of a very old one, but lead by example is what this sounds like right now, right? So live the brand, be the brand, be that person that embodies and lives and breathes the brand and others around you will follow suit particularly if you're an inspirational leader that people want to follow um, and some of these behaviors will help drive that by the way but if you live and breathe the brand others around you will as well and I think part that I want to add there Charlie is a bit about accountability as well either hold yourself to account for your ability to live and breathe by the brand and the values of the organization and your own personal values or have someone around you that you trust that is going to help you hold it to account. So if you have some behaviors that are not aligned to your personal and your, and your corporate brand, you need the ability, the psychological safety in your team for people to raise their hand and say, hmm, not sure about this. That doesn't, that doesn't sound like us. That doesn't sound like something that we would do. Why are we, why are we behaving like this? What are your thoughts on accountability? I mean, I, it's, it's incredibly important. And I think that's, it, it really ties into the first thing that I mentioned in that trust sense that you have mm-hmm. to trust people to be able to hold you accountable yeah. and you have to be amenable to that accountability. You can't have someone come to you and say, Hey, I noticed this, you're, this is kind of, it's coming across this way and it should be this way you know, from a brand perspective or, or just from like, you know, it, it, it's, it's rubbing people the wrong way. You can't respond to that kind of constructive criticism uh, with a strong negative defensive response. You have to be open to people holding you accountable. And I, I think that there are, there is, it is easy to say that you want people to hold you accountable. I think it's harder to actually live up to having people hold you accountable because, you know, people are very, can be very defensive about that stuff. And I've been in times in my, my career personally where I have, people have tried to help me and tried to hold me accountable to who I'm supposed to be and, and, and the, 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 what I'm supposed to be reflecting, right? As, as a leader from an account or from a project or from a team, whatever it might've been. And I have been, dis- I, at times in the past, like I was dismissive to them about the, the feedback or just like, okay, sure. Or even defensive and saying like, no, 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 that's not the case. Like you're, you're misunderstanding. Mm. And as a leader, you have to learn to grow through that because you can't, you can't be that way and really grow as a leader. And you see leaders that don't, make those adjustments and they get into leadership positions. Those are the leaders where they have the people under them on their team who are like whispering side to side at the meeting. It's like, oh, we got to really keep the mic out of his hand because he's going to go off on this right again, like something like this. And you don't want that. You don't want that at all. And so you, you have to trust people. You have to allow them to hold you accountable. And then you have to have the, the, the personal fortitude to, to look yourself in the mirror and say, they're right about what I'm doing and I need to do a better job of doing this. And I think when you realize that and you can do that as a leader, that's when you like come into your own in your ability to be the, this, this leader of a brand in a lot of ways, because it, you have to be, as I mentioned, sharp, like the edge of, of a spear, but you also have to be malleable. You have to be able to bend and, and, and to be flexible with what people need and what they want and what they desire and what they need to hear from you. So it's, 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 it's ever evolving, but it's so, I mean, accountability is so important. It's, it is so tied so closely to that trust. We've just done a beautiful circle back to personal brand and now it's personal brand as a leader. I'm going to reflect back on some of the things that we've already said. 
your personal brand as a leader is not what you say it is. It's what other people say it is. So listen to that story that Charlie was telling about you're portraying yourself on the world in the way that you want to be seen, but then the others are whispering behind. So it's your personal brand as a leader is what people say about you when you're not in the room. It's not about what they say uh, when you are in the room. If the two align, great, but it's what they say when you're not in the room that's important. So I'll, I'll, I'll give some personal examples here now, Charlie. So I, I'm very forward and I, I teach people commit to your values. It's my number one kind of leadership shift that I talk about, commit to your values. So I'm, I very much openly talk about my purpose, my meaning and my values and I talk about diversity of thought. I pride myself on deep listening. I listen with an open mind, with an open heart, with an open will, right? Just as an example. Other ones include things like inclusiveness everywhere. But let's just pick on that diversity of thought one. So I can go and tell my team that my number one value is diversity of thought and I want to uh, give them a voice and have their voices heard and for their opinions to be valued. But then if my behavior in every meeting is to shut down the conversation and impose my will, doesn't matter what I said. It only matters what they feel and what they talk about afterwards, right? So, so we've circled back to personal brand and I want you to think about that. As a leader, how do you want to be seen? What are your values and do you live by them? And the last one I want you to think about is that accountability circle. Do you have someone in your team that you trust that you give full open license? And hopefully it's your whole team, by the way. But you give people that psychological safety where they can stick up their hand and say, hey, and whatever they call you, boss, or call you by your first name, whatever. Hey, boss, that, that doesn't, that, this doesn't seem right. Now, you're not. You're not living by your values right now. You tell us that you believe in diversity of thought, but you're not listening to us and give them that power to do so. All right, really great, uh, Charlie. I want to change gears now because you're a, you're a brand storyteller and we talk a lot about storytelling in the world. We talk a lot about the power of storytelling. I think people are increasingly understanding that, maybe not fully, so let's talk about that for a while. And then I want to build into maybe some practical tips for leaders out there about storytelling. But let's start with the power of storytelling. Why do you think storytelling is so important? Well, studies, I mean, and not this isn't why I think it, but I mean, a lot of it, studies have consistently shown that the most effective way to get someone to remember something, to get a message across, to get a single point across, is to wrap that point in a story and in a nice little sandwich there. And I could tell you something about the brand 200 times, but if I tell you it one time in the middle of a story, you're gonna, you might remember it mm -hmm. uh, because it, it's tied. Again, we talk about emotions. We talk about those things. Uh, storytelling is, it, it, it's, it's almost everything when it comes to a brand because you have to think about so a story is not, it's just like a brand is not what you say it is. A story is not, your story. It is really this how you are interact you or your brand or whatever it might be is intersecting with someone else's story. That is storytelling. That is how it, it because if, if you want to get people engaged and you want people to have a sense of, of, of something. And a good example of this is I was on a on a new business pitch last week, right? And I could have told someone that my recommendation for them was that for this campaign, you should do direct mail as your strategy, right? I could tell them that and they might question it. They might say why, they might wonder why not. But I wrapped it in a story, right? And it landed incredibly well. I, I, when I went and I said, I asked, I asked their, their, I think their VP, I was like, how, how, how many emails do you get? I had your personal and your work email. And, and I think she said, she's like, oh, four or 500, something like that. How many letters do you get every day? You know, maybe three. It's like, if you had, so and you can kind of see, oh, I went into the direct mail piece that I'm talking about, like the impact that I can have. But introducing, and then this is, a, this is a weird example of the story. I kind of feel like it's a, to an extent, but like introducing 
and putting whatever message that you're trying to get off, uh, get, get across into someone else's story as a piece of telling your story and what you're trying to say, it, it's, it is incredibly important. And storytelling to me is something that it, it, it makes people feel good about the decisions that they make effective storytelling. It makes you feel good about the choices that you made. It feels, makes you feel good about the experiences that you've had. Uh, or it makes you I, not even necessarily feel good. It just makes you, it makes you feel something, something. about mm-hmm. those experiences. And, and it, it's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. But storytelling, could, you could be telling a scary story about something, but making people feel the emotions that you feel or that you want to them to feel as part of a story and going through that in a way that is captivating, uh, that is brief. I struggle with that sometimes. It, 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 having stories that are con- as concise as they kind of can or need to be. And, you know, when you get, and get into it, that, that, that being able to do that and effectively like you can say, you can say a lot uh, with a few words, right. And you can inspire with a, with an effective story and in a way that you can't do with numbers or statistics, you know, I could sit here and tell you that X number of people are hungry in the world right now. But if I tell you the story of one person, it's going to leave a much greater impact because the connection with people in storytelling and their, how they feel, how you feel, and the intersection of that is where you get that resonance and people really hook in and they're, they're paying attention to you. They're not on their laptop, they're not on their phone. Um, and I have a good example. I don't want to drag on too long about it, speaking of concise storytelling, but I have a good example of it from something that I've done if you, if you would like me to share. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, so well, I, uh, in, in my last agency, I worked with a lot of NASA science type scientists on their earth side of things. And you can imagine, you think of a scientific annual meeting presentation. You think uh, that PowerPoint slide has probably got charts. It's got a lot of words on it. It's got some functions. Uh, It's going to be hard to read. It's going to be like eyes glazing over type of thing. That's what you expect in a scientific presentation. It's almost like an abstract of, of of a scholarly article just on a poster board and, or, or in a PowerPoint deck. And, So I used to work with scientists from NASA Earth Scientists to help them better communicate. And we had a conference uh, here in DC for one of them, uh, for this group of ecological scientists from NASA. And I was working with this one guy named Andrew and was talking to him about, he was doing this amazing work investigating how deforestation was affecting these different species of birds. And he was gonna lead into his deck with like all of these words and all of these charts. I was like, cut all of this cut all of this and we're going to have the first eight, nine slides just be only pictures. There's not many words on this. And you're going to tell a story about why defending this species of bird is important to you. And then you're going to talk about the data and then you're going to talk about it this way. But we're not going to show any words. It's just going to be chart and you're going to speak to it and we're going to go through it. And, you know, we get up, it's a day of every person goes through the presentation and every single of the 150, 200 scientists in this room, everyone's head is they're in, there, they're in their computers and they're in their phones. They're not, they're not paying attention to anyone. He gets up and he goes into his presentation. And he has pictures. Every single person's eyes in that room were off their laptops because he was telling a story about why he did what he did that resonated with every scientist in that room because they all have a version of that story. And then he talked about the data. And then he wrapped it up by saying, how excited he was about the impact this data was going to have because of the story that you had heard in the beginning. And people in that room were captivated. And you do not use that word captivated when you're talking about scientific presentations like that, but even scientific presentations can be captivated. And so to me, that, that is always the example I go to when I talk about storytelling is that you could get the densest scientific data across with no words. And just by telling a personal story and by tying it into the, to what you're trying to get across from a point perspective and do it so well that you get such dramatically different attention. And he got so many people went up to him after. It was like, that presentation was amazing. Like, how did you do that? It's like, you just told a story, man. Like, that's, that's it. So it, there's, it's, it is such a crucial part of, of everything that we do as, as people, as humans, and as our species. Storytelling is one of the things that sets us apart from every other species on this planet. Uh, and so it's, it's, to me, it's, it's my favorite part about what I do. Uh, and it is, uh, it's, it's one of the most exciting things to do as well. Cause it's, 
it's fun to, to, to tell those stories, to help come up with those stories for brands and for people and for organizations. It's, it's a lot. It's a great time. So right now, I feel like you proved your point as you were telling the story, right? So I'm going to remember this story about the scientists who, who presented at a conference now uh, to remember the point about storytelling. So yeah, well, well done. Very clever and almost meta, I guess, there. So, <laughs> so, so, this, so the summary there is that stories are memorable. That's been the history of time. The history of man has, has always been that stories are memorable. The um, emotional element of it, that people uh, may, uh, this is Maya Angelou, I, I must use this quote, I don't know, 20 times on the podcast so far, but it's, it's, ve- it's very memorable as well. But people may forget what you said. They may forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And the power of storytelling is, um, is evoking those emotions so that they'll remember it. And then uh, way Charlie very carefully carved in there that, it, it needs to resonate with the audience. And if you can have an intersection of story where you bring the audience, whoever that person is, it could be a one-on-one conversation or it could be presenting at a conference. If you can bring them into the story and they can see themselves in the story, then bingo, right? So this is, this is where they're really going to remember it. We've got an upcoming podcast, Charlie, that you should definitely not miss. We've got Jeff Bloomfield coming on the show to talk about the science of sales, but it's really, it's the science of decision-making. And I won't steal any of that podcast now, but I'll give you the headline that then people make decisions emotionally and they justify them rationally. Everyone thinks that they make rational decisions. And it's just, even engineers are classic for this. They think that they make rational decisions. But the science tells us they make emotional decisions that they then justify rationally. So not only with storytelling are you getting to the point where they're going to remember you, they're going to remember you, they're going to remember the story, but you're also getting in into a position where they're going to make a decision. If they stay in the neocortex or, or the frontal cortex of their brain, they're going to kick into rational thought and rational thought does not lead to decision making. You need to get into the limbic or the root brain where they're going to actually make a decision. And whether that is you leading your team and leading them on a storytelling that ultimately leads to them being inspired into some kind of action or it's a customer meeting where you're trying to get them to make a decision and say yes, whatever it is, if you want someone to act, you need them in the emotional side, not the rational side. And everything that Charlie has just shared um, really embodies that. All right. So now we've covered the power of storytelling and we've either convinced some people in, in the audience that it's true or there's all already people that were already there and believed in the power of storytelling. What about people that don't see themselves as a storyteller? They, they understand it. They want to be a storyteller, but they don't know where to start. Any advice for them, Charlie? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I end up in that situation all the time. Uh, I, I tell a lot of people, I don't know if I've ever told you this, Mick, actually, but I tell a lot of people, most of my ideas happen uh, in the shower for me personally. Like I, I will, I do this, I, I shut, I will shut all the lights off in the entire apartment at night. So it's just dark. I'm in the shower. It's just thinking about whatever it is. Uh, if, if, if I'm trying, whatever I'm trying to tell a story about, right? If it's a brand, if it's a literal like article or something or whatever it might be. When I'm trying to write a story where I'm trying to tell a, a brand story or, or, or even one of my own, I think first about the takeaways. Like it's like any, it's like any strategy. It's like anything you would ever put together. You, you want to think about the goals, the objectives first. For me, I want to think about what do I want people to take away from this? Like, what do I want? How do I want you to feel after you hear the story? And a good example of that is, you know, in a sales situation, as you just kind of mentioned, for me, you always want people to come away from that feeling like they get you or like, they, like you get them, excuse me, and that you, you're basically already a member of their team and that you understand their needs better than they do. And you've just now met them. And so you could be, and, and, and I, and I, my favorite 
pitch memories of all time are always when we kind of lead in with a big narrative intro to inspire, to pat those people that are working there on the back and say, hey, you're doing a great job. The work you're doing is important. Like, cause I want them to feel that. I want them to feel important. I want them to feel like, yeah, I do really awesome stuff. And they get that about me. And so that takeaway and what they, what you want them to feel and how you want them to feel to me informs the story that you write and how you write it and, 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 or, or tell it if it's not written. And, and so for me, it's to get past that block you know, it's, it's, it's okay. I, I'm going to line. I want this person to come away from this feeling that, that I get, that they, that I get them. I want them to feel like I'm part, part of the team already, uh, that they can trust me. I want them to feel that, you know, we had that, that they want, I want them to feel the energy. I want them to, I want them to feel these things coming away from this. Okay. So from there, I've got these things I want them to feel. I'm going to think about myself in this sense. And then, okay. So when I'm talking about something, what shared experiences do I have with the person that I'm going to tell this story to that are going to, that could be ways into these feelings. And you know, I talked about the, the email example earlier when I was talking about the direct mail thing, right? I always, I, one of the, when I, when I give tips for public speaking or tips for doing a presentation in a public setting, one of the things I always talk about is to find the common ground there to find a place where you know that everyone in the audience, or at least 90, like most people that you're talking to are going to understand or know what you're talking about. And a good example of that is we all get a thousand billion emails every day, right? And so asking someone a question and saying, how many emails do you get every day as the intro to a story, one, it engages them and gets them involved in the story, which is also important. And two, it brings an intersection point where you and them now have a shared experience. And so shared experiences, yeah, good one. shared traumas, shared successes, always make the best connections and the best stories as a result. And so when you find those intersecting points from a story perspective and what's going to really resonate with somebody, I want someone to feel good about themselves. Okay, I'm going to compliment them about specific things that I can clearly tell that they have put a lot of time into and talk about those things because I know that's important to them. And I'm going to work that into my story. So I'm going to work that in here as a, whether it's a side note or it's the main feature of the story. Like I'm going to get it in there. And once I make sure all those things are in there, you kind of just puzzle that piece, that puzzle together. And it, and it, it kind of writes itself a lot of the time because you're going to get a good flow going of, okay, I want them to feel this way. And okay. And it's the same thing with the NASA example. It's like, okay, I want to get across this, this, mm-hmm. this essence of, I care about this for these reasons. And I know you care about this because of the same reasons. Right. And so I want to, I want to get that story across and find those, those shared experiences or create one. And so for me, when you, when you get those, the take, those key takeaways to do your little summary thing for you a little bit, those, do those key takeaways. And then you have, and then you use that to find intersection points between you and the people you're speaking to with those key takeaways. Yeah, and when you get there, the story writes itself to me. Yeah, really good, Charlie. And I will summarize back. That's what, what I like to do. It, it helps me it helps me with my clarity of thinking and I, hopefully it helps with the audience as well. So what I heard uh, from uh, Charlie there, and he used a story uh, around how he used his uh, shower as his, uh, where the place where he can be creative, his creative space, right? Uh, for you, that could be something different, but finding a space where you can uh, declutter your mind and be ready for creativity is what I heard there. Then what I heard was starting with the end in mind. What is the takeaway that I want them to leave with? And keep that simple, by the way. People will only remember one to three things. Uh, A very gifted person might remember five to seven things, but most people will only remember one to three things that you say anyway. So don't cram your story with so much content that they're going to uh, lose the story anyway, right? So remember the one to three things that, they, that you want them to take away. Remember the, or think about the emotion that you want them to feel. And then you've got two paths of what, I've, what I'm hearing from Charlie is, is about that shared experience, right? Is there a shared experience that you can share or is there a shared experience that you can create? A shared experience that you can share. So have a think when you've, decided on what you want the takeaway to be and what the emotion to be, have a think about, is there a time in my life where I've felt that emotion? 
And does that make a story that I can introduce into the topic? And that brings some authentic experience, your authentic self into it. If you can't stumble across it, then create the experience. Ask the person, how do you feel when you look at your email box in the morning and it's full of 2,000 emails? And then, based on, use deep listening to listen to what they say and then build that into a shared experience story, okay, by listening to them. But ask them how they feel. Don't ask them what. Don't ask them how. Ask them how they feel when X, Y, Z happens. And that will give you the basis of a storyteller. And the other one I'll throw in there, Charlie, as a, a little added bonus, is um, don't be afraid of the power of a metaphor as well. So a metaphor is a type of storytelling where you can, you can translate that into something that everyone will connect with. And it could be a metaphor that comes out of the other person's mouth that you build on, or it could be one that you introduce. Like, like imagine that you're sitting right now on, on a locomotive and blah, 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 like, and then off you go and you use locomotive as the, as the metaphor, but could be sailing, it could be anything, but just something that gets them, uh, gets their imagination uh, fired off. Yeah, re- really good, uh, Charlie. Yeah, oh, sorry, it looks like you've got... Uh, yeah, there's actually there. something you said in there that I wanted to touch on briefly. Yeah, please. You conciseness yeah. Of, 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 of that key message you want them to take away. Yeah. And I wanted to provide an activity that people could do. Oh, please, yeah. To- so uh, an activity that we do in, in almost all of our client kickoffs uh, is, is one that I call the messaging melting pot. Uh, and basically what I have people do is describe the value of their organization, their brand, their business, the product, whatever it might be that we're working on. Describe that value in one sentence. So one sentence is key because you want to make sure they're starting from a concise place. Uh, and if they are someone that is jargon heavy, they're gonna, they're, that sentence is going to be kind of long. Um, but that it is very helpful to think through. And you can do this for yourself too. You can ask yourself, okay, what is the value of the takeaway that I want them to have? Why do I want them to have this? I'm going to write it in one sentence. Then do the same thing, but write that sentence as if you're speaking to a seven-year-old or have those people write it oh, as yeah. if you're speaking to a seven-year-old. And when you do that, you're going to notice it, it's, it's an activity that really services jargon that we don't even notice that we use, even in non-business settings or everyday lives. And it helps us simplify that down to the, the common words, because ultimately I can sit here and throw postgraduate level reading level words at you all day. Maybe not all day, maybe for like 25 to 30 minutes. Um, <laughs> but uh, before I run out of them, uh, but I, that's not going to matter. You're not going to remember any of those words. I mean, those things, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we work with a client in the, in the geothermal industry. Geothermal is a postgraduate level word. Solar and wind are, third, are fifth and third grade level words on their own. And you wonder why those two are so much more talked about than the other. Mm. Uh, but it's, it, it's because the simplicity of the message has got to be in its most simple, like most common, like least common denominator state. You have to have it simplified to a place that, People can not only hear it and have it resonate and understand it, but also it had, that simplification allows them to ma- like mold that message and that feeling into their own personal experience. The more prescriptive you are, the less they can build and see themselves in that story. Yeah. And so the simpler you are with the wording, the better it is. So I just wanted to call that out. Oh, I really like it. It's I, super important. I love that exercise. And it makes me think of uh, Einstein's fav- famous quote, explain things as simply as possible, but no simpler. So you do need to get your message across, but break it down as simple as possible. And the thing that really triggered there for me, Charlie, was when you said that that allows them to kick in their own imagination. So don't be so prescriptive because then otherwise, you know, you're just droning on. Give them the the uh, the synapses firing in their brain to get their their imagination going. That's really powerful stuff. And a- another one I'll just leave on there about some of this power of communication. I'll just point everyone back to our episode with Chris Hewitt, where we spoke a lot about this, about breaking it down to three key messages instead of 16 because of things like the dilutive effect and and you being in the position where you're curating what you want them to take away rather than them selecting, right? So, so I mentioned before that people will only remember around three things that you said anyway, 
Do you want it to be the three things that you wanted them to remember? Or do you want them to pick and choose out of the 16 things you said, which ones that they took away? And for me, it's always the, the former. You know, you want to be in control of the ones that they take away if you want your power, your message to be powerful. And the dilutive effect, the more reasons that you put on, uh, on the table for things that, for them to remember, it just dilutes the message, right? So you, uh, every additional thing that you add dilutes the power of the first thing you said. So uh, look back at Chris's uh, episode on that. It's, re- it's really powerful. All right, lots of great takeaways here today, Charlie, and I love that you gave us some homework and some exercises along the way. I want to switch gears now, and my professional and intellectual curiosity takes over here. Sure. As I mentioned at the start of today's episode, I was once your client, a very, very, very happy client. And here we go. This, this, this uh, podcast is not sponsored by TOT Creative, but anyone looking for a creative agency, OMG, these guys are, are amazing. Now, here's the interesting thing, the out-of-body experience. When I think back to that experience, as your client, I never felt like I was your client. Everything that we worked on together, it was uh, with you and with Alison and with all of your team, it always felt like we were just in it together. And we had a wonderful time. We had fun and we did amazing work on two brand launches that we worked uh, on together. From the outside, I looked at your team and went, wow, this is a high performance team. The first thing I want to check in with you, is that how it felt on the inside? Yeah, I would say definitely. And, and to me, you know, we as a team are, you know, we, we always like to, you, the, the creative agencies are always like, I'm throw around the word collaborative and, and iterative and all these things, right? But, you know, as a team, uh, this is Crouton, by the way, say hello, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> for those on the audio podcast, uh, we have Charlie's cat coming in for a guest appearance and adding yes. a lot of value to the show. So welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and he, Regularly makes appearance on client meetings. This is about this is about you know you, you talked about clients and then he came on over. Um, and, and for me, the team dynamic and and what makes a high performing team is the trust between those team members. We talked about trust earlier in in terms of both coming up with the work, but also understanding that the great ideas can come from anywhere, right? And to me, you know, from the inside looking in, we're always a high performance team when we're working on these things because I think as a collective at Teodi, we recognize that, you know, while sure, I might have a great idea, Allison might have had a great idea, or Josh might have had a great idea, you know, all these other people on our team can come up with different ideas at different times. And to me, you know, I think that is, is part of why it comes across the way that it does in terms of the, the experience that you have as a client. Because you end up in a situation where, you know, we're not talking at you. You know, we're talking with you about the, the projects that we're working on together. And what makes us a high performing team in that sense is that, you know, when you, I guess the opposite of high performing is inefficiency. And the most efficient thing that you can do as an agency or as, as, a, as a, you know, professional services organization in some ways is to embed yourselves with the team of your clients and listen to those clients. And when you're working with them in an iterative fashion in that way, and you're listening to them, you're going back and forth and you're having open and honest conversations. It enables you as the agency to be this high performing team because you have a shared collective understanding with your client. And when you're coming from a place of a shared collective understanding, it, it's easy to do that work, right? Like you're working together on it. You know, you're not, I'm not coming to a meeting with you on a Monday morning, Mick, and saying, you know, 10 minutes beforehand, oh my goodness, I'm nervous. I'm talking to Mick today. I hope he really likes what we're designing. It's like every one of those meetings that we ever had, I'm coming to that and be like, oh, I can't wait for Mick to see this. He's going to love this because I know, because this is exactly what we've been talking about because we've been doing this together. And so to me, open, transparent communication results in, and that trust that comes between all the people communicating is what results then in high-performing teams. And so to me, it did seem like we were high-performing because we were working with you all 
who were excellent clients in that sense and, and were very collaborative and were open to those conversations and were transparent with us about what was happening, even when we would hit snags mm. and, and, and rough patches in what we were working on. And so that open communication, that stuff is empowering as, and, and really makes the difference between a high powered and a high success, highly performing team. And, and what, what is it really to me? Yeah. Yeah. Really good, Charlie. So uh, um, the key themes that I'm hearing there, uh, open and transparent communication, uh, trust, empowerment, diversity of thought and recognizing that the great ideas can come from any, anywhere, inclusiveness, all of those things are all ingredients of, of a wonderful work environment. And what I will then share with the audience is then as uh, Alison and Charlie's client, I felt every part of that. So when you have your team firing on all cylinders in that regard, where you do have diversity of thought, where you do have inclusiveness, where you're treating each other with respect and treating everyone like they matter. Uh, and when you're, you're embodying these elements of trust, your client and every other stakeholder that you ever interact with feels it. That's what I want to share with the audience today. All right. Fantastic, Charlie. This has been absolutely great. I've loved catching up with you personally. I've loved listening to you and your uh, storytelling prowess. Uh, There's so many great takeaways from, from today's episode and greatly appreciate it. I've learned a lot as I always do. And I know that the audience uh, will as well. So I'd like to close out now with what we call our rapid round. Um, so Charlie, what is the one thing that you know now that you wish you knew when you were 20? Oh goodness. Um, I wish that I knew when I was 20, I wish that I knew that I could say no to things because to me, one of the things that stood out, uh, you know, as, as growing as a professional is that one of the most empowering things to me, both personally and professionally has been saying no to things when I need to, when I know I either need to do something else or I, or I need space or I need, um, you know, or even for me, I, you know, to share a little bit about myself personally, you know, I, I deal with, I have a binge eating disorder that I've had since I was a kid and it's like mm-hmm. a chemical thing in my head. And so I, I'm always fighting against that. Right. Okay. And so part of that is tied to your self-worth. And I always used to go to the gym because I felt that I had to, because I was like, Oh, I need to be in shape and I'm eating all this. So I feel like I have to go. So realizing that I could say, no, actually you can say no and not do the gym. You can do it because you want to, you can say no to, you know, binge eating and try to make better decisions and empower yourself to do that. You could say no. And it's a weird thing to think about because it's a negative, right. In some respects, but like to me, learning how to say no to things. Cause I, one of my biggest criticisms as a professional has always been that I say yes to everything. And I always tell clients, yes. And sometimes I always do that. Right. Like being able to learn how to say no has been one of the most empowering things mm-hmm. for me. And as you continue to advance in your career, and I'm sure people listening know this as a, as a leader, it becomes so important to be able to say no or to say, and in some cases to say no, but in a lot of, in, in most cases, in some cases, no, but, but for me, it was, I wish I knew that I could say no to things. Uh, that I could I could be protective of my time, that I could take care of myself above work, above other things sometimes, and, and say no when you know things that I that, that didn't make a difference and ultimately did the end result of something. I, I never said no to it. Oh, well, thanks for the open sharing there, uh, Charlie, and I do think that's a wonderful wonderful advice. What's your favorite book? Oh, my favorite book uh, is that's an easy one. So it is right up here. We're going to reach for it. Uh, it is this book. It's called Contagious uh, by Jonah Berger, uh, who's a professor at Wharton, uh, University of Pennsylvania. And uh, it is, it's called Contagious, Why Things Catch On. Uh, and in here, he goes into the six steps uh, of, any, of why something catches on. And he talks about social capital. He talks about um, you know, all of these different components that make up effective brands and marketing and things like that. And, and it's, and it's an easy read. It's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a quick, it's, it's, you know, he's very well written. It's very, you know, easy to read. Awesome. I love this. I'm not oh. keeping this very rapid. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'll, I'll look into that one. I haven't read that. So I definitely will have a read of that one. Thanks, Charlie. What's your favorite quote? Oh, my favorite quote uh, is from the uh, poem. 
by Dylan Thomas uh, that is featured very heavily in Interstellar. Uh, but it is, uh, it do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Mm, that sounds like challenge the status quo right there. That's fantastic. Well, well, thank you, Charlie. This has been so wonderful. Uh, thank you again. Learned so much. I'm so sure the audience has as well. There's going to be people out there that are curious to know more. How do people get in contact with you, Charlie, or with uh, Teoti if they're, if they're looking for some kind of support in these areas of either branding or storytelling? Yeah, I, I am on LinkedIn. Uh, you can search me. It's just Charlie, my first name and my last name. Uh, but also uh, people can email me at charlie.feinerman at gmail.com or at my Teoti address, cfeinerman at teoti.com. I'm sure you'll have my last name up in the, in the podcast, so like that, that stuff. Um, and, and you can reach out to me there. I am pretty responsive in a lot of those places. Uh, and so, you know, I want to, by all means, reach out. Wonderful. And we will put those details in the show notes so that people can find it really easily. Thank you so much, Charlie. Been absolutely uh, a joy to have you on the show. Uh, we wish you a good uh, evening over there in, in the US. Uh, and thank you so much again. Thanks for having me, Mick. It's been a pleasure. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to be continuing our, our, our friendship and relationship past client and, and agency life. So this is great. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Leadership Project podcast at mixbeers.com. A big call out to Faris Sadek for his sound design and editing of our audio and video content. And to the whole team at TLP, Joanne Goes On, Gerald Calabo, Rika Vadanes, and my wonderful supportive wife, Say Spears, who is also our operations manager. This show would simply not be possible without you. If you've enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and review at Apple Podcasts. You can catch the video podcast and our video of the week at the Leadership Project YouTube channel. And you can join the conversation at the Leadership Project Facebook community group. We look forward to bringing you more great content and interviews next week as we continue to learn together and lead together. In the meantime, please do take care, look out for each other, and always remember to challenge the status quo.